views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access Fort Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at My special guests are Terry Dorn. Thank you, Patty. Always glad to be here. And you, Kevin <laughs> Lan Lan Leininger. 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 Yes. Oh, I, I was going to pronounce the G, you know. Hard, hard German G. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm part German, too. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, so, you are a reporter and columnist for New Sentinel newspaper. That is correct. How long have you been with them? I actually started there in August of 1979. So we're going on somebody wow. better than me at that's math, but 32, 32 33 yeah. years. Oh my yeah. goodness. Mm -hmm. That's about half my, never mind. <laughs> More than half my life, yes, <laughs> yeah. I've been there. <laughs> were you born here? Born in Fort Wayne, yes, went to school here, in fact, I was editor of the uh, high school paper in New Haven at uh, New Haven High School, ah, which is surprised. where I kind of got uh, interested in a career, went to Ball State after that, and uh, went to Valparaiso for two years. They didn't have an opening here in Fort Wayne at the time, and then after two years in Valpo, I came back home and been here ever since. Where's Valpo? Valparaiso is a, a town in Porter County up by Chicago. About wow. two hours from well, here. Well, that's a ways away. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I started a uh, newspaper called the Vidette Messenger, which had a circulation of about 15,000 copies every day. Oh. And, uh, that was know, in Valpo? In Valpo. Learned my craft, made most of my mistakes. You know, not all of them, but a good <laughs> chunk of them. And uh, then came here. So how old is uh, New Sentinel newspaper? A couple of years ago, we celebrated our 175th anniversary. Wow. Oh. So we've been around a good long time. Uh, and really, uh, I think as I recall the history, I mean, w there was a news and there was a Sentinel. And at some point, they combined into the news Sentinel. And uh, a lot of the old timers today, will, you'll still hear them call it the news and Sentinel. Oh, uh, yeah, so I, I, and I, Sentinel. Yeah, uh-huh. Because they, they merged. Calls. They merged, yes. And, uh, mm -hmm. So um, what motivated you to get into uh, the journalism and reporting and all that? Well, it, it, it's a very interesting job, for one thing. Every day is different. Uh, I think writing always was enjoyable to me. It came easily. And I, I look back, and sometimes I think, well, I, I just wanted to be Clark Kent. I read a lot of Superman comics growing up. and. Uh, watched the TV show, and it always sounded like, a, like an interesting job, and uh, it is. I haven't oh, yeah. really regretted it uh, a day uh, since I've started. I really enjoy the work, even though, like all jobs, there is some stuff about the actual job from time to time you don't like, but the work has never failed to be interesting to me because I can pretty much now, especially as a columnist, decide what I want to write. So if I'm bored with a story I'm doing, it's my own fault. Oh. <laughs> yep. I try not to write anything that will bore me or, <laughs> or the reader. I'm, I'm sure I do from time to time, but I try not to. What's your favorite column? You have several different columns. You know, I really, uh, it's probably like having children, although I've <laughs> only got one, but, uh, so I can't really know oh. for sure. But I, I don't know if you ever have a favorite. From time to time, I, I write things that I'm really proud of. Uh, I can tell you maybe about the favorite story I ever wrote yeah. at the News Sentinel. All right. Uh, yeah. And it's really one of the ones for which we won the Pulitzer back in 1983. But this was in 1982 when Fort Wayne had the second worst flood of all time, uh, oh. which most people, uh, if, if you were alive there, then or here anyway, you would remember. 
Yeah. But, uh, and I know, Terry, you were here, uh, but, you know, Ronald Reagan, the president, we knew was coming to town. Uh, and for security reasons, they never tell exactly where he's going to be until the last minute. So the new Sentinel staff, and I think this is in like April of 1982, we all kind of got together and uh, tried to predict where the president would be. There were a few places in town where the flood was the worst. And so by luck, really, not because I was smart, I ended up at Sherman Street right across the bridge oh, yeah. from the newspaper. And I got there before anybody else did. And so I thought, well, my bad luck, this isn't where the president is going to be. And I think I'm probably just about ready to leave. Yeah. When uh, pretty soon a bunch of guys in dark glasses and sport coats start <laughs> showing up with little you know, walkie talkies yeah. in their ear and I'm starting to think, okay, this is looking better. And then uh, some local cops start to show up and they start talking to each other. And I can overhear them, I'm just kind of standing around minding my own business and they start talking about, uh, okay, uh, we're gonna bring in kids to pass sandbags and uh, they started talking to the, to the kids when they got there and told, telling them, okay, you don't have to do anything until the president shows up and then start you know, acting like you're actually doing something. Mm. And I was only there to hear that because prior to that, as the media began to get word of where the president was going to be, they started kicking out all the reporters back you know, to the secure perimeter. Oh, wow. And of course, uh, if they'd have asked me if I was a journalist, I would have said yes. I was, but they never asked, and so I didn't tell, right? I didn't volunteer the information. If you don't ask, you don't And know. so I was there, the only reporter with an earshot of when basically they were setting up a phony photo op. And so every reporter in the country, and there were m media people from the networks with the president that day, as they always are, everybody in, in the country reported how Ronald Reagan showed up to help Fort Wayne fight the flood. And I wrote the story about how Ronald Reagan showed up and uh, put on a phony act for the media and actually got to interview the guy from Portland who lent the President of the United States his boots. Oh, yeah. And uh, the end of my story was, you know, I asked him, are you going to take the boots and have them bronzed? You know, the President wore them. And he said, nah, I'm just going to put them back in the barn. <laughs> and that's exactly what he did. They were there for the next 20 years. Oh <laughs> Wow. I knew just how much that would cost now. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, the moral of that story is sometime to get a good story, you work hard, uh, you do your homework, which I've done from time to time, but sometime you simply get lucky. lucky. And, uh, and that was the day I got lucky. Do you have any questions to ask? Well, I, I was going to say, I, I'm my favorite column. It's kind of delicate, but it was hilarious. <laughs> you may know what I'm talking about. But Fort Wayne has achieved various honors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dumbest city, fattest city, right. and I believe Olympus City. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the column you wrote. I, 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 I wrote about all those, actually. Uh, well, yes. that's <laughs> the one I laughed out loud. Uh, anyway, it was Tell really me about good. It. Well, I'll let Kevin. It was, well, it was in a national magazine, and so yeah, I, guess I think it's, Men's it's Health, for some reason, they love to put Fort Wayne in their, and, their and this, list. And this was just so you know, first Fort Wayne is called the dumbest city. Oh, the, uh, the absolute yeah, dumbest the city absolute in the country. Dumbest city. Yeah. That's why I, I wrote moved about, to, yeah. right? And then, and then, <laughs> I think the fattest city was the last honor we've gotten. Ah. but in the middle was this one, and Kevin wrote. Well, yeah, we was, were one really of the. Funny most, I think, sexually dysfunctional that was it. Okay, cities that's a in the country. Yeah. I'm, glad so, I, uh, I'm glad I right asked on top about of that. So actually, as I recall, I went over to <laughs> Boudoir Noir, which is kind of an adult toy store in town, and uh -oh. talked to the owner, got a, a few photos. And in fact, for a while, I was kind of on the adult entertainment beat. It, was, it turned into a joke because I had done that story. And here, you know, I'm an elder at church, a uh, oh very yeah. orthodox Lutheran boy but you know i was covering the opening of the largest strip joint in the state which uh, at the time was out on coliseum boulevard I did, I did a column on that and i've done columns about how the city handles zoning for strip clubs and adult oh, yeah. businesses mm -hmm. and so i didn't really go out looking for these things i just thought they were kind of fun interesting stories to do and pretty soon every time 
something came up, my editor would say, oh, you know, let Leininger do it. Yeah. And every time I did, I'd have to go to my pastor and explain, you know, I don't really <laughs> hang out in strip joints, but, you know. Yeah. It's my job. I, got, I get paid to do it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> tough job. So Absolutely. I'm sorry yeah. I asked the Well, the funny yeah, thing was, sorry. you know, when, when, the, when the strip joint opened, my editor uh, actually assigned a photographer to go out with me when I did the story on the opening. And he took, you know, very tasteful pictures, nothing really showing any close-ups of body parts you can't put in the newspaper. But he came back with the photos and the editor was shocked that there were actually naked women in a strip joint. Oh. So I don't, I don't think we ran any of them <laughs> after all shocking. that. <laughs> Boy, when he needs to get out but It was more. she, she actually, yeah. She needs to get out more, all right. Oh my goodness, I'm well, let me sorry, ask yes. Kevin. Uh, <laughs> Kevin and I go way back, you know, I do this show Theater for Ideas and still do sometimes. But Kevin reported on it, uh, oh. well, it must have been when you first started. Yeah, what year was your, f like 1980? Uh, it was around, yeah. well, the first show, I did the very first show on this Access channel. 1981. Mm -hmm. Rock and Roll mm -hmm. Friend or Foe and your boss, I presume was your boss. Ernie the editor, Williams. Ernie yeah. Williams mm -hmm. was a guest. Ernie was also a guest on it. He's a guest on several Theater for Ideas show, and he did a lot to help mm -hmm. Theater for Ideas with publicity. And maybe he's the one who assigned you to cover the shows. Yeah. I don't remember. You no, know, I don't the remember topic, but who assigned me. But I do remember coming to. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think we, more than one. You know, a few yeah, writing yeah. a story when from time to time. Back then and, was yeah. probably '79. We did a bunch of shows, and and uh, the new Sentinel was great, and had you, mostly you, but I remember other reporters as well. And we did a lot of those shows in what's, well, it was then it was the art school auditorium. Mm -hmm. And that's probably where. Well, I remember doing went. them, I think it was in the, the old library. Uh, yeah, in yeah. the old library, mm -hmm. both. And, and I asked Kevin one? if that was his greatest thrill in journalism or how he survived that to still be, be in journalism. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, as, you know, as I mentioned, uh, before we went on the air, uh, next to the Pulitzer, it's <laughs> yeah. definitely the highlight of my career. So. And sure. this is the highlight of my <laughs> career. I mean, Kevin Leidinger tell me <laughs> it's next to the Pulitzer. Thank you. Anyway, uh, it's fun to go back, and I know Patty had some questions That's about right. the go newspaper and the future. And you know, back then, I rem I, I'd go hang out actually at the News and Sentinel. Mm -hmm. In the newsroom <laughs> with, with Ernie Williams. Well, you know, and He's Ernie such was such a character. I, you know, Ernie was a great guy in in an institution, and I remember Ernie very well. Always had the uh, bow tie on. Yeah, and the red socks. The red socks. In fact, I, I imagine he was buried in them, as I he recall. He was. He uh, was. Yeah. And you know, Ernie was just a wonderful guy. Really, a a, a throwback to the old school journalist yeah. that the profession is losing unfortunately uh, you know there really aren't too. many people like that left that that came up you know through the ranks and and knew their community and and uh for better or worse were involved in things that not only reported the news but in ernie's case helped make the oh, news yeah, i mean ernie yeah. was very active politically no uh no secret that re the news sentinel was known then and to a lesser degree today as the republican newspaper the journal was the Democratic paper. Today, I don't think either one really has a party affiliation, oh. although we tend to still be more mm -hmm. conservative and they liberal. But Ernie was very involved, for example, of getting Dan Quayle to run right. the first time that. he ran for Congress. And mm. uh, Ernie was also very involved in various things. You know, River Greenway helped get that going. And I really miss him and, and wish we had more people like uh -huh. that today. I mean, I, I guess I'm kind of turning into the grizzled old veteran uh, without the Red Sox and bow tie. Well, he, he was, <laughs> as you say, but he was personal. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I could go in there in his big office and just sit there mm -hmm. and talk to him. Right. Unless he was busy. And, you know, mm -hmm. he had this one great line, Kevin. Uh, I'm sure you were the exception. <laughs> but I, I remember it was around 4 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, he was talking. We were talking about report, his reporters and stuff. He said, Terrence, who always called me Terrence, you could roll a bowling ball down that newsroom and you wouldn't see one reporter in that room. <laughs> They've all gone home. Oh, well. I just, that was just so funny. Well, hopefully way, that was before I started. The way, it might have been, but the way, the way he said it was just like well, so i got to tell you one, one last story about Ernie, and I think, and it gets to your point, but I, I must have been a junior in high school 
you know, editor of the high school paper at New Haven, as I mentioned. And I thought, well, I'm going to go talk to the editor of the New Sentinel about getting a job there. Mm. Didn't have an appointment. Yeah. You know, I just walked in the newsroom thinking I was hot stuff, said I'd like to talk to the editor. And believe it or not, Ernie Williams probably took 10 or 15 minutes to talk to yeah. me. You know, just some snot-nosed kid with no, no appointment. I don't know if that would happen too often today, but... Uh, uh, well, that's exactly I mean, what I mean. Hired it right wouldn't happen. happen. No, no, he didn't hire me, but I... But, I mean, you could just walk sure. in, a nobody, I mean, yeah. a high school mm -hmm. kid, and talk to the biggest... Right. Guy at the newspaper. Yeah, and they were. Just talk to him. Uh, yeah, and he told me what I needed to do to get a career in journalism. And I got an internship during college because I kept bugging him, frankly, until oh, he, he gave me a job. And, uh, and uh, the same thing after I went to work in Valpo, I, I kept contact with him and the managing editor, Joe Shibley, another yeah, really right. good friend of mine who's now also, unfortunately, oh. uh, deceased. Oh. But uh, yeah, so uh, for any young kids out there, if you want a job, uh, you really, especially in journalism, you have to go after it. I mean, it won't mm. come to you. Well, um, now he threw me off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Ernie Williams was uh, later an IPFW jur journalism professor. Uh, he was, yeah. I, as I recall, the man who started the program, actually. Yeah, he did. Oh. And I think it was after he was at the News Sentinel, retired, and he started mm -hmm. the journalism department. And then I told Patty, Williams Theater is named mm -hmm. after Ernie Williams. Right. And Ernie, you know, was there when Knight Ritter bought the paper in 80 or 81. And gradually, you know, they brought in their own editors. And Ernie was about, I think, retirement age anyway. Yeah. So that was kind of the, what precipitated him leaving the paper and I think going to IPFW was the ownership change when Helene sold it to the, uh, what was at that time, one of the largest chains uh, in the country uh, of newspapers. Yeah, one last Ernie story. We had a meeting with the cable company to, about funding theater for ideas, mm -hmm. and they weren't gonna do it. I mean, <laughs> this is long story short. And Ernie says, well, I can see a front page story in our paper tomorrow. He says it like that, and I'll be darned, they gave <laughs> us the grant. Mm -hmm. You know, didn't say it would be on them, didn't make a direct threat, just, mm -hmm. you know, they talked, just mm -hmm. like uh, they got the message. Yep. <laughs> He's a great guy, really, one of a kind, and you're right. Uh, the world ago? needs more Ernie Williams. How long ago did he pass? Oh boy, I would even hate to ha hasten a guess. Probably at least 80s. 20 years. Oh, 20 years. Maybe, maybe more. I, yeah. I did a Theater for Ideas tribute to him, wore yeah. red socks and a bow tie, and yeah. had some of his you know, friends. The older you get, the faster time goes, yeah, too. No I really kidding. have a hard time uh, no keeping track of what happened when sometimes. Yeah. So, what are the highs and lows of your job? Uh, well, the highs is when you can write something that you're not only pleased with artistically, mm -hmm. but also will have s hopefully some kind of a beneficial impact on people. Uh, you, you can expose the wrong that is corrected or you could give encouragement to people to, to do things. I enjoy doing that. Uh, the lows are, you know, when you make a mistake, when you screw up, uh, when things really, you know, you can't find anything all that good to write about, but you still have to write. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a space to fill. And I, I, I've never written a story or a column that I thought was not worthy of publication. Yeah. But, you know, if I walk in, I, I have a column Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And if oh, I wow. show up on Tuesday morning without a really good idea, or Monday morning, actually, I've got to write on Monday for Tuesday, I can't just go to my editor and say, well, I don't feel like writing a column today. Nothing inspires me. You know, you do the best you can and uh, hope to do better the next time. So that's really, you know, the low when I get the paper and I, I think, well, you know, I wish I'd have had something better to write about or I wish I'd have done a better job. Getting in fresh writing. ideas. The, the idea is always key, I think, for any artist of any kind. I mean, once you have the inspiration, actually mm -hmm. putting it down on paper is the easy part. It's right. always coming up with an idea that you think is worth doing that is the challenge. Uh, once you do that, uh, the rest uh, is fairly easy for me, and, and most people, I think. I'm a lyricist myself, and I write for mm -hmm. musicians and singers. And I'm on a TV show, mm -hmm. and I'm, they always want me to do a poem. 
<laughs> every time I'm on. <coughs> so mm -hmm. I have to pick a topic and just write yep. on it. Mm -hmm. So I know what you mean. Yep. Sometimes it's on demand. Sometimes you just want to mm -hmm. write it because it's there. Mm -hmm. um, when you ad uh, how did you adapt to the newspaper business as it grew from when you first started, like from the changes, uh, digital mm -hmm. and uh, online? And the all typewriter. That. Well, you, I don't go as far back as when reporters were writing things out longhand <laughs> in <laughs> pencil. But when I, when I started, Just we were still using yeah. typewriters. Right. Uh, when I got to the new Sentinel, they, they were just beginning to put in computers. Right. The reporters were still working on typewriters, but the editors had a computer. And in fact, when I started at the new Sentinel, the reporters would write on a special kind of sheet of paper with light blue lines around the edge, which would give you the margin. And uh, when you were done with your, your paper, you would roll it up, put it in a container like you get in a bank, oh, really? uh, a bank drive yeah. up, and you had pneumatic tubes running all through the building. Oh my. And we would put the oh thing really? in, in the container, put yeah. it in the tube, <laughs> it would go somewhere, I never <laughs> did quite figure out where. They would scan it into the computer, mm. and then the editors would work on it right. uh, and edit it that way. And uh, you know, gradually that was phased out in terms of now, you know, writing on computer. And uh, we used to uh, still deal with, with paper after, you know, to put it on the press, it was uh, run, and run the paper through a wax machine, actually, that would put a, a sticky thing on the back of the paper. You'd glue it to a big sheet that was the size of the newspaper page. That would be photographed right. by a huge camera, and then they would put that on a plate wow. on I used press. to be a typesetter myself. Yeah. I mean, and today, Jeez. of course, it's it all is. digital. We write on computer, or sometimes now we write from home. You can even write on your smartphone or your laptop, yeah. you know, any number of ways. And of course, gradually, uh, I hate to say it, but it's probably true, you know, the actual print newspaper yes. is fading away. Is it? Well, our, you That's know, funny. newspapers nationwide, and I'm not <coughs> giving away any, any secrets, you know, circulation is down uh, for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is when you give it away for free online, yeah. There's a disincentive to actually pay money for it. I, I wish we had never done that. I think it was a stupid move, quite frankly. But we have. Most newspapers uh, just uh, gave people no reason to actually pay money for their product. So how do so you get paid? Do you have people sponsoring you? Well, we still ha you know, yeah, print the paper, so we get advertising revenue that way. We get sur or a subscription fee for the print. Yeah. And we do sell ads online. Right. That's what um, I thought. So the theory is eventually newspapers uh, will be more like radio and television where it's essentially free to the reader or the listener. Although uh, they may try to impose a subscription online at some point. Some papers are doing that now. So that's what's with, happening. With a mixed degree of success. But I think their hope is, as people begin to go to the web more often, and they can track precisely the number of people who click on the web and on individual stories. Wow. Huh? So they know exactly you know, which stories are the most popular. So they can go to an advertiser and say, we had 100,000 people visit our website today, for example. And the theory is, and I don't know if it'll prove to be true, but the theory is, as more people move from print to the web, the advertising revenue on the web will go up. Mm. Whether that ever matches what the ad revenue from print is now remains to be seen. I'm not terribly optimistic, but we hope that it will because quite frankly, if newspapers ever go away, and you know, quality journalism to a very large degree will go with them because mm. television and radio, yeah, because of the, of the eco economics of it, don't have the kind of staff newspapers traditionally have had. And, and that is a function of, of revenue, quite frankly. Uh, you know, the more revenue, the larger staff you can afford to have. But we've got a staff probably, you know, a mm. third the size of when I started 33 years ago. Third is really? And, that's, and we're still trying to cover 
the same, same of uh, roughly the same amount of, of stuff. Wow. And obviously, you can't do that. So uh, by, by definition, That's the reporting, you'll, you're either not covering things you used to cover, yeah. or you're not doing it as thoroughly as you used to. Well, and what, what you're really missing now in, in media in Fort Wayne and smaller towns especially, you don't have the investigative journalism that you once had where we could tell a reporter, you know, take a month off and look into the story. We don't have that luxury now because if we leave one reporter not writing anything, you know, that's a, a fifth of our staff and it's difficult to fill the paper up even with the staff we have with quality stuff. So we pretty much do what we can every day to cover the basics and every now and then, you know, do a little more. But, uh, you know, if the economics of journalism don't change, I think that'll be the direction we're heading. And that's why you're seeing a lot of people go to blogs and, and you know, the internet media, which- Research on computer. And, and like anything else, there's some good stuff online and, and not very good stuff online. Yeah. And as a, a consumer, you have to learn who to trust and, right. and who not to trust. Discernment. Whereas right. in the old days, for better or worse, if you picked up a newspaper, you thought, well, if it's in the News Sentinel, it must be true. Today, I'm not, all, I'm not yeah, sure you can always and, say and that. And plus, reading the newspaper, like over dinner, mm -hmm. is kind of an American yeah, tradition. Yeah. Right. That, that, Same that, with Canadians. So it's yeah. more than just the paper, the reporting that mm -hmm. we'd lose. Yep. We lose a tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, there's no replacement, I think, for that actual paper, like a book, too, of this, mm -hmm. all this so electronic stuff. what's in stuff. the future? Well, uh, we don't know. I, what I can say, Journalism in, in some form has been around since, you know, the cavemen were scrawling on the walls with a rock. Uh, people are always going to want to know what's going on. They're always going to want to be told a story. Mm -hmm. So fr from my standpoint as the writer, it doesn't really affect me that much, uh, at least in theory. Now what's changing is as we go more digital, they want me not only to write the story, but shoot the photograph. Yeah, yeah. Shoot the video, they, you know, if, if, <laughs> yeah. if I felt like doing it, which I've kind of resisted. And then now they want me to be on Twitter, not only you know, oh. like writing my story, but also marketing my story. Like, well, read what I've got in today's paper. Yeah. So it, it is beginning to affect the creative aspect of journalism in ways that with the old technology never happened. I never had to care how the press worked. And nobody expected me to. They just wanted me to write the story and then... It was that somebody was else's job. Well, our minute, we have less than a minute. And I would like to thank you, Kevin, for coming well, on to you. my show. You had to come on my show again. And yeah, with thanks, you. Kevin. Well, we've only uh, great to see you again. We have. Yeah. And you, thank you, Patty. We have to have you on again. All right. Yeah, do come. Fine. This is Patty Hunter of Patty's Page. And I do like to thank you for coming in to this studio with us. We enjoyed having <coughs> you as a company. Thank you.